Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, we're just going to wait just a few more seconds so everyone loads in. Perfect. Amazing. I'll just start off. Kia ora, kia ora, numai harimai, and welcome to all. My name is Joey Lee, and I am uh, part of the partnerships and relationships um, team here at The Circle. We are thrilled to have you join us in our fourth episode of the After Next series. We all think about the present world we live in and wonder what the future will be like. We live in the now and the next, but how often do we think about what comes after next? This series is an inspiration for envisioning the future with fresh and distinctive perspectives. Our partner, Emphasis, is an organization who is passionate about driving change and will help build a more equitable and sustainable global community. We are so proud to be associated with not only this series, but with many our many other initiatives on our program. Our previous episodes of Afternext have focused on sustainability, closing the digital divide by 2030, and the metaverse. Today's events delves into how ge generative AI is reshaping experiences and development in our society. We are joined by a star startup panel today. We have Professor Toby Walsh, Chief Scientist, Laureate Fellow, and Scientia Professor of AI from the UNSW's AI Institute. Dr. Andrew McMullen, Chief Data and Analytics Officer from the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, and Dr. Ian Opperman, Chief Data Scientist from the New South Wales Government. And of course, we have um, our lovely moderator, Professor Sally Eaves, Chair of Cyber Trust and Senior Policy Advisor for the Global Foundation of Cyber Studies and Research, all the way from London. Thank you, Sally. Now we look Pleasure. forward to hearing your questions and we encourage you to use the Q&A or the chat feature down below, so please, load them up. I'm sure our panelists will be happy to answer any questions you have. We are on the record today and we will be sharing our recording on our YouTube channel following the event and you can follow the discussion on our Twitter handle at businesscircle underscore or via our hashtag the network effect. I will now pass over to Andrew Groth, Executive Vice President and Region Head of Australia and New Zealand from Infosys to share some opening remarks. Thank you. Thanks Joey. <clears throat> thanks, thanks very much and I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians. Where I'm coming in from today is the Camaragal people of the Eora Nation. And I'd like to thank their elders past and present for looking after these lands and these waterways for many, many generations. And my respects to all First Nations people uh, right across Australia. Uh, kia ora to all of those from New Zealand and greetings to all of those from all around the world. It's really great to be here again with the circle, uh, Joey and, and all the team. It's been really great to partner with you since we started this After Next series last year. As you mentioned, um, you know, we look at how we can have that great dialogue amongst industry experts and organisations to drive change, to build a more equitable and sustainable community. And yes, we've done great series before around sustainability, the digital divide, divide the metaverse. And of course, today, talking about AI is, is really, really timely. Um, you know, we're foraging into this world of AI with even more investment, um, a massive network effect that's being created um, and, and a huge hype uh, recently around the whole area of generative AI. And you know, it's getting a massive amount of attention and I think today it'll be interesting to discuss why, why is generative AI getting so much atten attention? Why should we all care? What does it mean for us? You know, we see uh, a number of organisations using sustainable strategies, trying to improve data, building practices to trust in advanced AI. And certainly at emphasis, it's something we've been doing ourselves for a number of years. We work as a live enterprise, uh, which is about being sentient to our people, our external environment, our customers, the world we operate in. And our focus is very much evolved to become an AI first live enterprise as we, we go about our business and our mission to amplify human potential. We actually did some research recently where we looked at um, global organisations. We looked at organisations, large organisations with revenues over 500 million. And from that research, it found that data and AI could generate over 450 billion in incremental profits worldwide and really become the cornerstone of enterprises looking to gain that competitive advantage. And so as we see that additional value, you know, there are of course still questions, questions that have to be answered 
around responsible use of AI, ethical use, how do we trust AI, um, what is the accountability and, and the governance issues. So I'm really looking forward to this discussion today. Uh, as Joey mentioned, we have an amazing, amazing panel of speakers. Uh, Professor Toby Walsh, of course, uh, as mentioned, is the chief scientist at the University of New South Wales for AI. He's a laureate fellow and scientif scientifica professor of artificial intelligence in the School of Computer Science and Engineering. Uh, he's also an adjunct fellow at the CIS CSIRO and Data61 and very well known throughout the industry. Um, we've been very fortunate in emphasis to work with Toby on a number of occasions, so it's wonderful to see you again, Toby, and thank you very much for, for being here today. Also pleased to introduce Dr. Andrew McMillan from the CBA. He's a former lecturer and research associate in statistics and previously the director of customer analytics and decisioning at the Royal Bank of Scotland. His current role at the CBA is the chief data and analytics officer in the technology committee. And he leads the data and analytics team responsible for the delivery of world-class data and analytics and technology capability for the business. So welcome, Andrew, to the session today. And Ian Opperman, who is the New South Wales government's chief data scientist working with the Department of Customer Service, is an industry professor at the University of Technology of Sydney, UTS. Uh, and from 2015 to 2019, he was also the CEO of the New South Wales data and analytics session. So again, a great thought leader and delighted to have you here today. Thank you very much for joining us Ian. And finally, our friend Sally, Sally is, um, who we will be moderating the session today. Um, she is the chair of the Cyber Trust and senior policy advisor for the Global Foundation of Cyber Studies and Research, a CTO by background. And once again, joining us in the evening from the UK, Sally, thank you very much for being here. Pleasure. This is gonna be a conversation. And uh, with that, let me hand it over to you. Fantastic. Thank you, Andrew. Really appreciate it. What a great conversation area to dive into today. And I'd love to get straight to it because it really is one of the big talking points of our time. So much conversation, even just this week around obviously chat GPT is one example, but just generally I think diving into the value of generative AI, but also some of the complexity as well. And you really set up that up brilliantly around compliance, governance, ethics. We could go on. So we're going to dive into that today look where we are now and, and in the spirit of everything around Aftermax, where we're heading to too. So you almost kind of set up the first question there, kind of really setting the stage. What I'd love to do is look at the journey from, you know, AI has been around since the 50s. Lots has happened now to bring it to the point we are at. What are we looking at at this next stage? So much hope about generative AI, so much hype as well. But why the attention and why the level? Why should we care so much? So let's set the stage from there. And perhaps, Toby, we can start with you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're right to say that you know, AI has been around since 1956. Um, and and um, I think there's a synthesis, a combination of factors that's all coming together, a tsunami of factors. Uh, both we've got the compute, the data, uh, better algorithms and investment. But I think what, what's distinguished generative AI um, from uh, the AI that we've had in the past is that generative AI, by its very nature, is somewhat more creative. It's creating new content, whether that be audio or video or, or text. Um, and the AI that we've had in the past mostly has been um, do, for doing things that were somewhat dull and repetitive. Um, and now we actually have AI that can create much more new content. Um, and that raises fresh questions. It raises fresh questions about things like intellectual property. Uh, also, I think it challenges people in new ways. Um, that There are jobs in the past where people thought, uh, white collar jobs that they were pretty safe from the machines um, because they were doing more creative things. And now uh, with generative AI, I think people are reassessing those <laughs> that assumption that just because they were um, writing novel content or, or, or whatever, that they were safe from being replaced as, as, um, and perhaps they're not just as safe as, as people on the factory floor who were doing more dull repetitive things. So um, I think uh, it's putting together really fresh questions. Um, I think it's also worth pointing out just the scale of investments going into AI at the moment, where you see um, billions being invested. Um, Microsoft put $10 billion, another $10, another $10 billion into open AI. Um, we're seeing um, very large sums of money being thrown at the field, um, and that is going to have um, very large effect, and it's going to really change business. I, can't, I don't imagine the big tech companies, companies like Microsoft or Google, 
are going to look the same. They are going to, you know, they're inc incorporating generative AI tools into all of their products. Um, and I think you can actually see, I think the way to, to see it is, is not to see it as ChatGPT. ChatGPT is just the beginning of the iceberg. It's the first example. I, I liken it to when I saw the first demo of the first iPhone, I thought, oh, that's going to change how we interact with computers. We're going to have phones in, in our hands. We're going to walk around with them. It's going to be a new way that we compute. All of our computing is going to be um, affected by that. And similarly, um, the idea that we're going to have a conversation interface. All of our programs, all of our devices, we're going to have a conversation with, and it's going to have, we're going to be able to say quite intelligent things, and it's going to remember the context, and we're going to be able to give quite complex abstract instructions. Um, and so the way to see it is it's not chat GPT, but to see that all the ways that we interact with computers are, are going to be uh, adapted to this more conversational style. I couldn't agree more. And I mentioned chat specifically just because of the hype around that this week yeah. um, on kind of where we're heading as well, you know, potentially integration with Bing as one example, but I couldn't agree more strongly. So many verticals that will be affected like this, you know, from media to healthcare. I think we saw even just last week, the US medical licensing exams, for example, where we saw like passing of three levels of that, for example. So I couldn't agree more. Massive impact <laughs> it, it, across verticals. Yes, chat, chat GPT or I've come over with chat GPT or Palm past uh, the um, you know, yes, uh, medical exactly, yeah. exam. Um, what actually I think is more worrying was the pass mark is only 60%. Indeed, indeed. That didn't get covered. Uh, so I'm actually more totally worried that there that. are doctors out there who only know 60% of the answers. Not that, not that ChatGPT got just, uh, only just passed, just got over a little bit over 60%. Exactly. Is that a really, really interesting point? And again, the power of the narrative around that. I don't think that's yeah. been discussed enough. So yeah, I totally agree with that. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. Start setting the scene. And perhaps, Andrew, could I bring you in now as well for your take, just to set the level playing field about where you're seeing this heading right now? I think, I think Toby covered it really well in terms of um, the investment that's being made across the globe at the moment. I mean, obviously, the advancement in compute and the science that goes with it, but I think that people and organizations like Microsoft's 10 billions, academics everywhere in the world, everyone's investing in this and you can do degrees and PhDs in AI machine learning now. So that capability in addition to the investment being made is uh, advancing it beyond, I think, where many of us thought it would be today. Fantastic, thank you. And Ian, I'd love to hear from you too. And then we're gonna go into some of the details on this. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Uh, certainly, it's also got uh, governments excited about the potential for AI. We've run a, a number of, of town hall meetings about what we should and should not do with it and the sort of areas that we could try experimenting with. The really big difference between the, the most recent releases is just the, the, the power of them. Most AI systems up until now, especially those that you interact with as digital assistants or with, with chatbots, have just been really disappointing. Uh, these are not. These are actually pretty impressive in what they can do. Absolutely. I totally agree with that. I did, I did a mentoring session on Friday, funnily enough, um, with kind of people who have been Gen Z, Gen Z kind of demographic and kind of demonstrating this hands on. That level of difference was really, really clear to see. So I, could, I couldn't agree more strongly. And that kind of demonstration piece really brought it to the fore. Thank you, Ian. And what I'd love to do and perhaps stay with you in first, if I can, um, when we look at the, the potential here, and that's, that's very, very clear, but when we go through um, you know, change like this, we have to kind of get the foundations right, don't we? We have to learn from what's gone wrong in the past and kind of put that into play and reflect. So what are you seeing, perhaps from a government point of view, first of all, around what we need to put in place to kind of protect from some of the potential risks here? So from a policy and procedure point of view, what are you looking at to kind of get these benefits, optimise AI as a force for good, but negate some of the risk factors as well? So perhaps, Ian, if we could start with you from that governmental perspective. Thank you. Great. I mean, I think Toby mentioned it, that, that AI has been around for a long time in various guises. And when ChatGPT came along and, and everyone was suddenly surprised and impressed by what we could do, we, we did have to remind people that in New South Wales, we have an AI strategy, an AI ethics policy, and also an AI assurance framework. So what we've been doing is helping people remember that what we've already put in place around the, the less impressive uses of AI, if I can put it that way, but also give a little bit of guidance as to what we what we really must do from a data privacy, data security, cybersecurity perspective. So we've been trying to just let people recalibrate a little bit. Their expectations have changed, but then go back to 
we've got policies, we've got frameworks, we also had le legislation and regulation, but we're adding some complementary information about, okay, specifically now using chat GPT, this is what it means from a cybersecurity perspective, do not put confidential personal mm -hmm. Uh, information into a chat GPT and expect to get a new policy for New South Wales. Do not put your credit card details in. It's just really a matter of regrounding people and providing a little bit of context for just these, these amazing new tools that have come out. And I imagine we'll have to do that again when the next generation and the next generation of tools come out. But the principles and policies we've got work well the adaptation to take into some of the new things that we've suddenly seen amplified through these new tools is what we, we constantly need to be doing. Fantastic. Thank you. And I'd love to bring in a couple of questions at this point as well that lend themselves really well to this area. So um, this is an anonymous one. Um, but the question is, should society be concerned that AI training and input is mostly being developed around a masculine perspective? How can we ensure cultural and non-discriminatory or exclusive learning is incorporated into the global model of AI? Whenever large sums of money are involved, there's a strong drive for ROI, but it can be at the expense of those who are seen as a revenue source or control mechanism for the market. Um, Jen, Tracy, sorry, from Business Circle wants to come in on that one. So Tracy, can I hand over to you? Thank you. Sorry, I was just answering that it was come up, it's come up in the back end. My apologies, Sally, for that. But to the oh, panel. no problem. Sorry. No, that's absolutely <laughs> fine. Thank you, Tracy. Sorry, I thought it was a specific point there. No problem. It's live, everyone. So not a problem at all. Thank you very much. And um, perhaps Andrew or Toby, would you like to come in onto that one? About getting sure. that setting right so that we're not developing things from the start where there's risk, for example, around non-exclusive um access. So perhaps Andrew or Toby, one of you would come in on that one. Thank you so much. And sorry for the confusion. Yeah. So yeah, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll... Oh, no, Andrew, goes for, you go for Andrew, please. Yeah, I'm happy to go first, um, Sally. I think building on what Ian said as well, it's very much um, built on the principles and the way that you think about how you use AI. So from the Commonwealth Bank point of view, um, and Ian mentioned that the government already have some ethical principles around how to use AI. And we were one of the organizations that worked with the government to come up with those. Um, so I do think that you, you do need to be cognizant of what AI is learning from and the data that it uses um, to come up with the answers. So particularly everything that's ever been digitized and all of the chat GPTs, et cetera, they're learning on data that could be potentially biased in terms of um, when it was written and uh, the, the narrative that was around at that time. So from an organizational point of view at CBA, we're very focused in making sure that we understand completely the use cases. We have our own policies. Um, actually, one of my roles within the organization is I am the AI risk steward for all of the group to make sure that the principles and the policies and every single use case of AI is well considered before um, we would do anything with it. Superb. Thank you, Andrew. I think Toby, you wanted to come in on that one as well. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I agree. We sh we have spent a lot of time thinking carefully about the ethics and, and ethical guidelines for AI, and, and therefore we don't have to start from scratch. Uh, but but equally, uh, all every time we extend AI, we push it into fresh use cases. And so, for example, the UK government has just announced it's going to develop a code of practice for generative AI. Um, and there are some fresh questions. I mean, there are interesting questions about intellectual property that generative AI is starting to throw up. And indeed, there are a couple of class action suits going through in the US at the moment about whether this has been fair use of all this training data and whether um, uh, Microsoft's um, co-pilot um, uh, is returning adequate rewards um, to all the coders who uploaded code onto GitHub and equally all the artists whose, whose data is being used um, to train some of these um, text to image tools, um, whether that's actually going to sustain. So I think we're going to see some interesting interesting developments and, and responses that, that adapt to these new use cases. Um, and then I think the final observation I wanted to make is that um, I am seeing some worrying trends, though. Um, companies that were um, more conservative in the past are dropping that that in, in the face of intense competition. So let me just give you a name names here and illustrate with a simple example, uh, which is that um, 
Google uh, has, has a very large language model, uh, Lambda, which is very capable. And they had rightly decided not to release it for public the public use because they were worried about misuses of it and misinformation that it might give out. That was until OpenAI um, got in bed with Microsoft and announced the collaboration on Bing. Um, and Google um, immediately responded by um, announcing they were going to release BARD. Uh, that turned out to be a bad mistake and that they were right to be worried about the mistakes because there was a mistake in the demo of, of Bard that wiped off a hundred billion dollars off the share market cap of Google as a response, seven percent of share price of Google. Um, and I think we are seeing companies jump in with perhaps, and we also saw at the same time Microsoft lay off some of their AI ethics and team. Um, <laughs> Oh, uh, not a very good look uh, when you're worried about the responsible deployment of, of these technologies. So I'm I'm a little worried that in the race to 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 get market share to be first player in this in this uh, marketplace, that companies may be actually going back on the good practice that they developed um, for past waves of AI. Such a strong point there, I think. Absolutely agree with you there in terms of, you know, we can't have things around competitive advantage negating, as you were saying, the progress that's been made with some of the AI value, like frameworks that have been developed and some of the other aspects you spoke about there. I couldn't agree and, more. And I'm, and, I'm sure yeah. Andrew will back me up, but, but actually, you know, I think that would be very short term if we end up doing that, because um, there are going to be some big mistakes made and some um, some painful mistakes. And it's going to not just be PR, they're going to be um, legal, ac legal actions and, and the like that will... Uh, so you're actually putting a significant risk of, upon your long-term viability if you make the, make these sorts of mistakes. Totally agree. And I think what you were saying about from the arts point of view and creativity, I think around AI kind of trained artistic content, I think personally, I think we're going to have quite a rise around, for example, generative AI copyright challenges yeah. alongside some of the AI ethics that you mentioned earlier on as well. I think that in particular um, bias and data sets, uh, set, sorry, kind of lack of multicultural representation, I think is quite strong areas I'm seeing at the moment. So absolutely spot it's, on. I think that's absolutely it, huge. It's very much, I think, like Napster. I mean, when we started yeah. streaming music, Napster took off and, and stole all the content of artists. And that wasn't sustainable. And Napster, Napster had to, to change. Um, and now we do pay people i'm not sure we pay them enough but we do pay them for streaming their work and i think the same is going to happen to to generative art uh, j ai art that we're going to have to work out a way of making sure that suitable recompense comes back to the artist because otherwise it's not sustainable just like napster wasn't sustainable to steal all the music Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Really interesting area. And I'm, I'm getting a few more questions on this. So I'm going to try and come back to that a little bit later, but I'm actually going to pivot slightly now and also react into one of the other audience questions, kind of looking at a different effect of, of the rise of this in terms of the labour market impact and the shifts this is going to have. Um, so we're looking at obviously that, that raised adoption of AI, the advancement of AI usage. Um, but now, obviously, everything we're setting the scene here with this rise of generative AI and what that means. So not just from like the the AI market now, but looking ahead again, that spirit of after next kind of up to that five year period, but also its effect on skills specifically. And I'm going to put my hand up there and say I've got a bit of a bias on this particular answer and say, you know, I'm very passionate about STEAM skills and about holistic skills and learning for life. I'm seeing kind of the rise of the generalist, kind of a specialist skill set but with that holistic understanding across a whole theme range of skills. And I might come back to that a little bit later if we have time, but I'd love to throw that out there. It very much reacts to a couple of kind of questions we've got coming in about how do we support kids? Um, but also I would say adult learners looking to reskill up skill too with these different job evolutions we're seeing and particularly around creativity. So perhaps if I could go to Andrew first on this one, please. Thank you. What are you seeing from this skills market perspective? Yeah, I love that question, Sally. Um, tackle it in a couple of different ways. One of the things that we're very focused on as um, a company that cares very much about the success of Australia is working with academic institutions and the government to think about what more we can do to uh, invest in this area. How do we make sure that we've got the right university degrees and education at schools, et cetera. So we're very involved in that area. And then also from a workforce point of view, one of the things that we've done over the last few years is introduced a reskilling program within Combine. So as we see the shift in the skills that are needed to be able to serve our customers brilliantly every day, we are training people who maybe used to work in frontline jobs to be able to come and engineer with us or become analytics professionals uh, or even get involved in machine learning and AI if they've got the desire to kind of reskill in that area. 
Fantastic. I love that. And one very quick feedback. I also think it's not just the skills accessibility, but also things about how to support people applying those skills as well. So learning styles, metacognition, that kind of area as well. So kind of smart thinking alongside the smart technology and supporting that as well. So I love those points, Andrew. Brilliant. Um, Ian, would you like to come back in on this as well about skills for the future? Sure. So I, I think the interesting thing about STEAM is that the E and the A really need each other. And what, what the, these new tools have really shown us is that we are really challenged by what we think creativity is and what we think the, the real human value add is. To be fair, generative AI, which allows you to create a, a jazz track in the style of Miles Davis, requires, requires Miles Davis to have, have existed and produce a beautiful portfolio of work. Yes. Uh, but the the ability now to to create novel content is somewhat challenged because there's this synthesis and there's this interpolation which is now possible based on these huge libraries. So it, when playing with ChatGPT myself, I, I, I really asked the question: what's what's the real human contribution here? Very quick anecdote: I asked ChatGPT to write a speech in the style of me. I said, first of all, do you know who this Ian Ockerman person is? Yes, great. And write a speech in my style. And I looked at it and thought, that's not very good. I handed it to my wife. She said, yeah, that's you. You wrote that. <laughs> I was really disappointed <laughs> because I thought there, there was no real substance. It didn't really get to the really, really important issues. But Therese said, yeah, no, that's you. That's you. That's no problem at all. So what, it, what the, the heart I took away from that was there's a role for judgment. Chat GPT can synthesize, it can find connections that we didn't expect, it can find anomalies, it can do all sorts of really interesting interpolations, but the judgment as to whether or not this is meaningful, significant and relevant still remains a human element. So areas which are really, really reliant on what, what we can do uniquely, and again, that's something which we're going to be challenged with for a while, what we can really do uniquely, judgment's part of it because it's our value system and our frameworks that we're looking at to say, yes, relevant, not relevant, or yes, appropriate, not appropriate. I think even those statements will be challenged over time, but the ability to, to remain STEAM, the E and the A working together, I think is really important. Mm -hmm. And the ability to identify what is, to apply judgment and those, those jobs that require judgment, I think will be really quite important. Superb, and totally it, agree with that. Thank you, it, Toby. Over to you, <laughs> it, Ian. I think I think probably the problem is that ChatGPT has has been explicitly trained to to be rather middle of the road to offer try rather balanced opinions. Uh, that was a deliberate design so you can train it to, to be other things and that therefore the speech that it wrote for you was probably a bit a bit too balanced and not taking enough of a uh, of a position um but i think the the important thing is to realize that these tools um are only augmenting us and there's lots of places where you still need human oversight and they'll make stuff up um they 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 um so they so that you can't actually completely replace people um, and I think what we're going to see is that it's not that people are put out of work by ChatGPT, but it's the people who use know how to use these tools will replace the people who don't know how to use these tools. And so it is behoven on us to make sure that, that people are educated into the possibilities of how you can amplify your productivity, augment yourself with these tools. Um, and so the initial response that you saw from uh, you know, public schools around um, uh, Australia, which was to ban ChatGPT, was really short-sighted. At the end of the day, these tools are going to be a natural part of our life, um, and you don't have to waste time drafting the first um, the first draft of a business re reply letter. You can get ChatGPT to do that and just edit it, um, and that will mean that you can write your letters that much quicker and waste less of your life writing pro forma business letters. Um, so I think we, what we have to see is, is um, embrace these tools, use them within education, um, give people the skills um, so that they can be sure be part of the group of people who know to, how to use AI, who lift their productivity and not be part of the group of people who don't know how to use AI um, and are the people who are unfortunately replaced. Really interesting point, Sophie. Thank you very much indeed for that. And also lots of questions coming in at the moment. So thank you very much, Stephen, and a few others that have come in through as well. 
they fit in really nicely to something a little bit later on. So please hold that thought and I will be coming back to it. I just want to pivot slightly now um, to look at a different aspect of this conversation, which is kind of also around the rise of green digital as well. And it's something I was kind of really diving into very close hand at MWC very recently. And it was very noticeable that everything around carbon footprint, um, how that relates to digital was center stage and right from a, a kind of deeper level. So from network, from architecture, from processor level, which I think is really, really important. Um, but when it comes to our AI conversation for today, what are you seeing in terms of carbon footprint focus in terms of this rise of AI? What can be done to kind of reduce that impact too? Um, perhaps, Toby, I'll start with you on this one. Thank you. Uh, obviously, you know, the climate is what is the greatest moral crisis that faces humanity today. And we should be very aware of, of the carbon footprint of everything we do. Um, and it's worth pointing out these technologies um, have great potential to save us um, our carbon footprint. The, the, the very fact that we've all come together over Zoom has saved huge amounts of, of, of carbon that otherwise, if we tried to do this physically in person, that we would have been consumed. So I think it's worth remembering the benefits. And, you know, I've done a lot of work with businesses going in and optimizing supply chains um, and reducing the carbon footprint of those supply chains by 10%. Saving fuel, saving saving diesel on, on trucks because they drive less distance. Um, and we should be aware of the carbon footprint of these large models. They're very large. They take a lot of training. Um, but actually, if you look at the numbers, um, they're actually quite modest compared to many of the other things that, that, that your organization is doing. And many of the places that your organization could be using um, AI to make better decisions and reducing the carbon footprint. So um, we have to be mindful. Um, but actually, the footprint is of these models isn't um, that big. Um, many of them are trained on um, data centers, which are running on green energy, um, uh, hydroelectric power in many cases. Um, and so actually, I think we, what we should be doing is looking to see how we can use AI to reduce the carbon footprint elsewhere as much as we should be worrying about the carbon footprint of the AI itself. Could not agree more. And I think, you know, just generally we're in this age of tech convergence at the moment. Um, and, I, and I look at kind of the smart infrastructure for which AI is part. And actually it can be the kind of the hub of the wheel in many ways for reducing carbon in so many other areas. It can have that contagion effect. So I couldn't agree more strongly around that. Andrew, Ian, did you want to come in on that at all? Um, and if not, I've got a lot of questions around trust in AI. So that's going to be the next area to, to drill into. I would just build on it, Sally. I think both um, yourself and, and Toby covered it really well. Uh, you've got to make sure that you're absolutely carbon neutral and you're being really efficient in how you're using the data and AI. But in addition to that, I think you both made the point that you can use AI to help Australia as a nation be much more cognizant and aware of what they can do to be um, doing things that are better for the environment. Absolutely, absolutely. Brilliant. Thank you, Andrew. And Ian, I'm going to pivot to you naturally anyway, if I may, because there's, there's a few questions that have come in, a couple of specifically really, really tailored to you. Um, but I was going to pivot to trust anyway. And a lot of the questions coming in really drill into this issue of trust, having it or not, basically. Um, I really wanted to pick out um, a question from Stephen, which is around generative AI concerns around transparency in training data and how those are being addressed. But also and it pivots really to the job question as well about um, what the government is doing to support potential losses of jobs that generative AI will, will catalyze. So they've mentioned specifically areas like marketing, paralegal accounting and copywriting, and obviously other verticals as well. So if I could pivot there, Ian, if I may, what are you doing and what are you seeing around trust? What are the indicators of that? I would certainly say for people looking at Edelman as a barometer for that, got 17 years worth of data, definitely have a look at that as a general kind of take on this, but specifically around generative AI, love your thoughts on that, Ian, and what the government's doing right now around some of those concerns that are coming to the fore in the chat. Thank you. Uh, great. Uh, trust is a very, very big issue, as you might imagine. And we've been looking at trust with use of data, trust with use of digital over the course of, of the last uh, at least seven or so years that, that I've been in the chair. And it, it's one of the fundamental principles. But then the question is, how do you map that principle to the tools that you use? And how do you, under, how do you ensure that what you're doing is an appropriate thing with the data and the AI? I, I mentioned the New South Wales AI Assurance Framework some a little while ago in this conversation. And what we, what we do is we say, let, let's look at what we're doing. And if we're a little uncomfortable, let's take the AI piece out 
and see whether we're still uncomfortable. Let's take the data piece out, see whether we're still uncomfortable. And if, it, if we're uncomfortable about what's left, then it may well be the data and AI are amplifying something which is a, a somewhat less than perfect process and that, that amplification creates potential problems. Then we put the data piece back in and say, well, what are the data issues we need to consider? The balance, the bias, the representation, what are the AI things we need to consider? And at least then what we've got is a, is a better understanding of what we're doing and how we're doing it. But that's, that's clearly not good enough. The, the, the best approach we've taken so far is to reframe the conversation around outcomes. And in New South Wales, we've got a couple of outcomes frameworks, the human services outcomes framework, the smart places outcomes framework that says what we're trying to achieve looks like this for health and education and safety and well-being altogether. And we can set our parameters around what we mean by that and then try and work backward through and how do the tools and the data support it. Again, that's a that's a fairly sophisticated approach, and we've only got outcomes frameworks in a couple of domains, and even that's not good enough because ultimately there are a whole lot of other elements around trust and demonstration of trustworthiness. We need to explore what happens when things go wrong. We need to be very clear about what we will not do with data in order to help build confidence that we're behaving appropriately and demonstrating trustworthiness. And even that isn't enough because, of course, we can clearly identify what looks to be okay now and what looks to be really not okay now, but we need to find frameworks to think into that space in the middle, which allows us to understand, okay, if we are the frog and we're in the pot, what we want is a thermometer, a ladder, some instructions for when to get out of the pot, and also some, some views about what is the right way, you know, when we should actually jump out of the pot. So it's, it's, it's not a done issue ever, there are elements to it that we're trying to ensure that we are appropriately and responsibly using data, digital, and AI. And we also have a, a set of, of, of essentially a, a, a watchword, which is deliberate but cautious. We are going to use AI. We are going to use data. We'll do it deliberately, but we'll be really clear about what and when and how. And also we'll, we'll do it cautiously, but we are going to move forward. Excellent. Thank you so much. And, and again, another thing I think is really interesting, and I mentioned Edelman just because of the wealth of data that there is there, but also don't make assumptions around kind of expectations and behaviours and, and how those, those change as well. One thing I found really fascinating, I, I dived into that data quite specifically for a specific project, um, and around, for example, governance around AI and how that affects trust or not. And I, I've rarely used the phrase tipping point, but forgive me, it's late, it's late in the UK, so I'm going to use it right this moment. But it was really interesting. It showed that over kind of levels of added compliance, there was a point where actually it started to reduce trust rather than increase it. There were some fascinating nuggets in that, in that data. So definitely recommend taking a look at that if you're very interested in the trust question. Um, and also EY, I think it was Signal AI, some really interesting um, research around that too that I definitely recommend diving into. And as a pivot question, kind of the other side of trust and kind of rather than fear and risk, what we can enable through generative AI, a great question here around what role do you see in actually AI being, sorry, generative AI being the catalyst to solve problems? Some of the, particularly around the SDGs, I think is the biggest way to describe this. So they've mentioned specifically climate change, healthcare and education and how that can be an enabler for change. So perhaps we can pivot it to this area now um, and Andrew or Toby to come in on one of those. I saw you, Andrew, looking like you were keen on that one so I might pivot to you first if that's okay. Yeah look I, again I, I really like the question I do think that um, even thinking about the trust and the answer to that like every organization must be completely uh, cognizant of every use case what data are you using and uh, not just could you do it but should you on everything that you're trying to use AI to do and you know, I always, I always believe that the use of AI or any advancing science or technology is a representation of the culture of an organization. So for us, the, the use cases that we have are very focused on our purpose of trying to support Australia and Australians to um, have a brighter future. And the areas that we're really focused on can be like service. If you think about every time you call a call center or you go into a branch, how much more easy can we make it for our uh, frontline staff to serve customers and get the answer to the question that customers have? Whereas before, you may have had to kind of go through lots of documents to find exactly what the customer needs. Now, it's a literal sentence that you type in and it pops up the best answer for that particular customer. Excellent. Thank you so much. And Toby, did you have any final thoughts on that one? 
Yeah, I, I, I will go to the SDGs because I think it's worth remembering there are great opportunities here. Um, so if we pick you know, education, which is central to a lot of the SDGs, um, the fundamental challenge we have AI is, is dual use. So there are misuses of, of generative AI. People have already you know, very quick to spot on the, that people could get their homework answered. They could write, write their essay using generative AI. And the knee-jerk response, of course, was, was Australian schools to ban it. Uh, but that that puts aside actually the great possible benefits that generative AI can, can build. Um, it makes actually the perfect personal tutor. A friend of mine taught themselves Python programming in an afternoon because you can sit there, you can ask uh, chat GPT questions. It doesn't matter how repetitive, how stupid, how silly the questions stand. Um, it will answer and it will answer very well. And so she quickly learned how to how to um, do Python uh, for Python programming. Um, and so here we have a tool that can provide a personalized individual tutor to everyone at almost no cost at all. So there are fantastic opportunities available with the technology if we think carefully about, you know, what are the positive use cases? Love that. And honestly, it's that safe space as well, because, you know, as part of education, that confidence aspect is really, really key. And, and for some people, it's very difficult to ask, to ask certain questions. I think we've all been there. We all remember times back at school and, you know, do, do you say something or not? So the fact that you can do that in that space, be repetitive, keep asking questions, and you've got that kind of like safe area to do it, I think there's a real benefit there in so many ways as well. So absolutely love that. And the SDGs is my big passion area. So I really wanted to get that in there. Thank you, Tony. Another example is it, it can actually mark your essay or mark your mark, yes. mark your exam. Indeed. I don't know a teacher who likes marking. I'm not suggesting necessarily, again, you should do this without any human oversight to check the accuracy of what the mark is, but it can provide very good feedback. So, so for example, students, before they hand their work in, can actually ask the tool, is this going to get me the A grade that I want or that I need to be able to, to finish my degree? Um, so again, a, a great positive use case where, where students can get immediate feedback on their work um, and work out whether they've actually done a good enough job yet. Absolutely. I love that. And, and also support with, for example, identifying things like learning styles as well. So helping you to kind of understand what works for you. Because again, I think curriculum sometimes traditionally prioritise, say, one particular style or a couple uh, over others. But I think it can help you find what works for you and be a kind of smarter learner, which can help you revision and your performance, et cetera, and your confidence as well. So really interesting areas. I love that. Fantastic. And another area actually hasn't come up so far. Perhaps you could talk about the experience. You know, personalization of experience has been a, in a growing trend for quite some time, really. Um, I think COVID really, really catalyzed that even further. And not just around consumers, but, you know, employees as well, and also other ecosystem partners in the broader community. So I'd love to drill in a little bit about what you're seeing with not just generative AI, but kind of machine learning and more broadly as well, how this is maturing and how that is affecting that personalization of experience across different verticals too. One of those, I think, is particularly interesting, kind of drawing on what Toby was saying there about Python and financial services, but the banking and financial services sector see a lot of a particular change there so perhaps Andrew if I go to you first about that particular virtual and spread it a bit more widely thank you yeah thank you Sally this is an area of uh, interest for us and has been for the last decade probably making sure that for every interaction we have with our customers we make that a personalized experience and if you think about the rapid increase in how customers engage with digital. So in our app or in our NetBank channel, we want to make sure that every time customers log into the app or onto NetBank, the information that they are looking for is readily available and personalized to them. So that, that's been a huge investment in something we call our customer engagement engine, which uses thousands of models to run over uh, the real-time data that we have to serve the most important conversation or experience to customers in every interaction that they have, down to the point that you know different customers like to see things that are different, different pictures, different representation, different words used to present information to customers. So we're very focused in trying to make our experience for customers as personalized as it can be. Fantastic, thank you. And as I said, perhaps we can spread this a bit more broadly now to different sectors and areas. So we obviously mentioned education literally just now. So perhaps we could pivot beyond that potentially to maybe healthcare or a different vertical, but how are you seeing that kind of maturity and how that's affecting experience kind of beyond financial services? Thank you. Yeah, well, I think you know, one of the greatest promises um, in the longer term is, is to personalize medicine. The fact that 
that we can now read your DNA at relatively cheap cost. It costs a couple of hundred dollars to, to read your genotype. We can now write DNA. Uh, CRISPR is, is one of the ways we can write DNA. Um, and so we have the ability, um, you know, and how are we going to process all of that information? Well, it's AI, right? So there's, um, the UK has a gene bank, half a million people have, have, have uploaded their DNA, the genetic information, along with all their phenotypical uh, medical uh, data alongside that. And that's an amazing place to actually go and data mine and find things out. And you can do, you can already do some amazing things. We can predict how tall you are to within an inch at birth or even in, in, in utero. Um, and predicting whether you're going to be tall or not, maybe not very uh, medically very important, but we can predict, for example, whether you're going to be susceptible to bowel cancer. Third most deadly form of cancer, um, actually normally um, entirely treatable. In most cases, most cases about bowel cancer, if they had been caught in time, would be treatable. But unfortunately, because of the nature of bowel cancer, by the time we know you've got it, it tends often to be sadly too late. Well, now at birth, we can tell whether you're someone who needs to be screened. We can have those blood tests um, from an early age so that you will be found um, if you do. I mean, of course, this is not a minority report. We can't predict um, who is going to get bowel cancer because there's various environmental and other factors that we don't know about. Um, but we can predict whether you're susceptible and therefore we can save you an untimely death. And so the possibility of personalized medicine, I think, is one of the greatest uh, promises that AI is going to bring into our lives. Absolutely. Again, on a very personal note, absolutely agree with you so, so strongly on that. And I think bowel cancer is such a strong example of, of, of how this technology and data can make a difference in terms of making the invisible visible in many ways so much earlier. I think absolutely, absolutely key. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Ian, could I bring you in as well, just from the government standpoint, particularly around how this is affecting kind of citizen involvement, engagement and service delivery overall? I'd love to hear that take too, Ian. Thank you. So New South Wales for a long time has taken the attitude it wants to be the most customer-centric government in the world and, and it takes that quite seriously. And in fact, the, the, the Department of Customer Service was created as a new central part of government. And until now, what we've been talking about is essentially joining up services around customer journeys, so birth of a child, death of a loved one, getting a job, moving to New South Wales, things like that. And that's that's been quite effective in terms of changing the way people think about how how government can engage with with people and actually calling people customers irrespective of whether you live here are visiting here or even in the prison systems you're still a customer what this now provides the, the possibility to do is, is again once we lift some of those so those fundamentals and get the platforms and, and the, the, the concrete pieces in place we can start to really customize that delivery of service but there is a there is a limit to just how much customization people want from government. So for example, if you're logging on and don't need to uh, constantly credential yourself and constantly say, you know, I am the same person that I was for transport, I'm the same person now dealing with health, that's very, very useful. And people really seem to want that. But there are limits around just how personalized the service delivery from government needs to be or, or is accepted to be. And again, that's one of the things that we think about with the AI assurance framework is, is this appropriate what you're doing? So if you were personalizing a fine, for example, and saying, well, we, we understand your, your circumstances, uh, Toby, we understand your circumstances, all the things going on in your life. And so we're going to treat you a little bit differently. That might be too far versus <laughs> just the, a simplified delivery of, of, of a penalty notice or something like that and providing easier ways for people to understand how they can deal with that penalty notice. So, so government is, or New South Wales government is certainly thinking about customer centricity and even the language of customer is part of that there are limits to just how personalized that service might be for different circumstances but it requires us to think about every single use case differently and rather than do a one size fits all absolutely and getting that kind of active listening with what people are wanting you know from from the, from the government as well in terms of that service delivery and making sure that outreach is there as, as part of that conversation i've seen some great stuff you know as part of the background to this about what you're doing around outreach as well i think that's so so important you know everybody's voice has to be heard and again we can't make assumptions about what we think might be the right way to interact getting that all there together is, is so so important so i love the work you're doing there really really important thank you for very much for sharing that and i'm going to looking at some of there's lots of questions coming in um, and I want to just cover some things that we haven't kind of dealt with so far just to make the most of our remaining time here and um, one of them is around the data conversation itself um, now obviously we know that obviously data, data centricity we're just talking about it right now but we're getting increasing complexity I would say in terms of multiple sources of data coming in 
that need to constantly refresh. Um, and there are definite organizational inhibitors around that. It can be affected by kind of size of organization and resources and things like that. Certainly things I'm seeing as challenges around integration, uh, I would say visibility, um, and also around like talent around some of the, the supply demand um, challenges we've got here as well, but also right data, right role, right time, kind of this active intelligence that, that we're um, really driving for at the moment. I'd love to get some advice here, just looking at some of the questions here about what can be done to improve this um, and support some of these inhibitors. So what would you suggest, what recommendations you would, you would give to kind of enhance data sophistication and quality, um, just generally as well to make the most of this generative AI opportunity. That's kind of bringing together most of the questions we've got at the moment. Um, perhaps, Toby, I'll start with you on that one. Thank you. Uh, well, in terms of the generative AI, it's worth you know, re realizing these these tools are rather generic. And one of the things you can do is specialize them. So if you've got a special data set, um, your the information in your in your in your company file system or whatever it is, um, actually, whilst it costs millions to train a large language model, um, it could cost quite just a few thousands to actually specialize it to your data. So there's great opportunity. To, to get it to speak the specific language of your business or your or your particular customer. Um, and then also the you know the size of the text windows that that, that provide the context um, are now getting bigger and bigger. Uh, GPT-4 lets you, I think, have 25,000 characters. So you can put a large chunk of the data that you have or the information, recent data you have on that person as the context for the question. So it will actually try and be a little more specific to the person. So I think there's great opportunity there. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And Andrew, I'd love to put this question to you here. And just in the in the interest of time as well, I'd love to pivot this to you at the same time, if I may, if I could, if I could make this work. But we had another question came in, particularly just with your obviously your, your really strong background in this area with financial services, also getting questions around digital identity as part of this as well, and how we can improve digital interactions, you know, things like single sign on that type of area as well. So if, if you wanted to bring that into your answer as well, that would be wonderful. Thank you very much. Yeah, look, I think that's definitely an area that uh, we have been working on. And we do have conversations with the uh, government and other agencies as well about whether or not you know, Australia could uh, have one form of digital identity, which uh, would be usable in more places than just in financial services. So that, that's an ongoing conversation. You know, I think the, the question on, um, again, I'm always thinking, the team are always thinking about the, the proactive and positive use cases of, of AI. And when we were talking about the data that's available and actually linking to some of the other questions, you can use AI to actually improve the, the processing. We do this all the time. We monitor a lot of the compute and the systems that we have using AI to make them more efficient, to make sure that we're not you know, burning more energy than we need to. Um, and also you use AI to make sure that you only have one copy of the data that you need, because I'm sure many organizations have had a situation that over time they've got duplicate records across all of their data estate. So use AI to kind of identify data that you don't need to have in the platform so that you can be more efficient in what you're doing. Great point there as well. And very quickly, I think it echoes other points we're seeing beyond generative AI. So kind of that duplication you were talking about there, but also kind of sprawl in different areas as well, whether that's kind of tool sprawl or cloud or even vendor to a degree as well. I think there's quite a lot of interesting um, kind of discussion points for another day maybe on that. And, and also data waste to opportunity as well. Now, given some of the supply demand kind of talent gaps I mentioned just now, can we use some of the data that isn't being used? You know, our data that's archived, I think it's around 89% of it isn't touched again in any meaningful way after three months. So can we use that in a safe, open data sharing way as a, as a training aid for whether that's people, you know, in school at the moment or older adults looking to reskill. So really interesting areas there. Thank you so much. Um, and Ian, your, your take on this as well um, in terms of kind of this data challenge and how we can support organisations to, to overcome that, to, to get the best of this opportunity. Yeah, the data is, remains a very substantial issue. There's, there's a couple of particular aspects around the generative AI, around the sort of rate at which generative AI can generate more data and generate more things to go out there on the internet. In, in the potential is that everything we've ever written as human beings can suddenly be amplified, magnified many, many times. And so there could be a lot more junk data out there on the internet in future, in which case we might actually need AI to help us sift through that junk in order to find the right things to train, the, find the right data sets to train our AI on. 
But there are my three favorite words in the English language are data sharing and standards and put them together. I'm a very, very happy person. <laughs> we still have we still have a lot to go in terms of the fundamentals. One of my daily frustrations is getting people to share data with each other in a safe and appropriate way. And we've still got a way to go there. We still have frameworks we need to build. We still need an understanding of, of consequences of use of data, elements of, of personal information and data, elements of privacy around of sensitivity around data and use of data products, which are created. And generative AI wonderfully has shown a really important spotlight on these issues. And just like some of those, the other areas we talked about, all of a sudden, these issues, which have been a little bit theoretical, a little bit will get there one day, suddenly have arrived. And they've arrived with their, their suitcases packed and they're coming to stay. And so, so we've, we've got an opportunity to go back to re-examine the fundamentals, re-examine the urgency of putting those fundamentals in place and, and make some real progress around the data, the sharing and the frameworks. And you know, I've got to thank the generative AI for actually doing that. Fantastic. Thank you all. And I can see Mikhail has just joined us on the live stream here at the moment as well. I'm about to hand over there. I don't know if we've got about 30 seconds each. If you wanted to give a final takeaway before I do that handover and do a round robin, I'm not sure if we've just about got time for that. Um, so perhaps if we just do Toby, Andrew, Ian, just if you had a final piece of nugget of advice, and I'm just really thinking about some of those questions, a few of them were quite tangible about where can I go for support? Where can I get some quick information now that you would trust? Anything like that as a final takeaway would be fantastic, kind of 30 seconds to a minute, and then we'll bring you in straight away, Mikhail, for final thoughts. Thank you so much. I'll end with how I began, which was pointing out that ChatGPT is just the beginning. That It's going to be a quite a wild ride as this technology matures. And many of the things that go wrong with, for example, with ChatGPT today are being fixed already. Um, and so um, we're only just seeing, uh, scratching the surface of what we're going to be able to do with this technology. Fantastic. Thank you. Andrew? Yeah, I'd, I'd build on that. I'm excited about what we can uh, deliver over the next 10 years using um, AI, the advancement in machine learning, particularly as society becomes more digitized. I can see great um, capability being available to kind of support the experience of our customers and Australia as a whole. Superb. Thank you. And Ian, your final thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. AI is a tool, a tool driven by data. And as exciting as all the possible use cases are, and there are many, many of them, we always need to come back to tool driven by data and think about the issues we need to understand with those two elements. Superb, so succinct as well, brilliant, fantastic. Thank you so much. We could go on for another hour, I know, but we are kind of two minutes from the end, bang on time. Mikel, I'll hand over to you now for your final thoughts. Thank you so much. And thank you all to the fantastic panel. Brilliant conversation, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you um, very much, uh, Andrew, Toby, Ian and Sally. Um, very insightful session. So it, it's given me great pleasure that I deliver the vote of thanks today on behalf of Infosys. Um, I'm, I lead, I'm part of Infosys Consulting and I lead the AI automation practice across the region. And to be honest, uh, yes, this could have easily gone on for hours. There's so many questions, so many great insights. So thank you so much. But look, I wanted to share some some key takeaways. I mean, so many. I mean, you know, um, this conversation can keep going, but you know, we covered things like policies and procedures, education, the future of jobs, role of humans, um, you know, trust and governance. And then we spend a lot of time on some great use cases, both from a personalization, but also to build that trust. And, you know, some, I just want to share some nuggets, which I thought were just outstanding. You know, I thought, Andrew, Ian, you really brought to life the core foundations that actually the assurance frameworks are there. They've been tested, but it's all about now applying them and, and keeping them robust. And, and I think Toby made a fantastic point that um, the principles values will keep getting tested and ultimately reward IP and, and, and you know, making sure that we're not uh, we're cognizant of the competitive pressures that exist remain, you know, very, very great point. I think Sally, you made a great point that skills availability, but also smart learning and, and uh, you know, thinking as to how we, how do we adapt is critical. Um, Toby, you know, role of humans, um, educate on possibilities. I think every one of us should be looking at how do we augment and look at being part of this and how to use that is the future of jobs in this space and, and it's about augmentation. It's a great point again. I think, um, you know, when we got into trust governance, I, I, once again, back to that point that we don't have to start again. A lot of this exists and we've got that for foundation. It's about mapping principles to tools. It's amplifying it's testing. And I thought Andrew gave some fantastic examples of how he could do this in a very practical way. 
Um, and then finally, I think from a use case perspective, many, many examples of how it can be applied, how we can continue learning. But ultimately, you know, I thought the, the finish there was fantastic. It's ultimately still about being cognizant of the sharing and the standard. So, um, and, and being very critical to, I guess, the value and keep adapting that. So, um, look, fantastic session. Thank you so much. Um, and, and, you know, I uh, look forward to, I guess, being part of this um, again in the future. Thank you so much.